Hi, everyone. This is Jason Key at Harvard Medical School, SB Grid. Thanks for joining today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Frank Delaglio joining us from uh, the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research. So Frank is the developer of NMR Pipe. The, uh, I know it's my sort of go-to NMR processing tool. I think it's everybody's go-to NMR processing tool for um, biological NMR. So Frank's going to tell us today about concepts in um, spectral processing and non-uniformly sampled NMR data. And then in a week, we're going to follow up with a software tutorial. So Frank, are you there? Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jason, and the chance to share the work here. So here's our system check slide. Looks good. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So as many of you know, NMR Pipe is at its heart a spectral processing engine. But over the years, we've augmented it to address many of the steps in going from raw spectral data measured on the spectrometer to information about biomolecular structure and dynamics. So today we're going to talk about spectral processing, and in particular, we're going to talk about the concepts behind non-uniform sampling and the methods that we use to reconstruct this kind of data. The lecture materials that we see here today are posted on the NMR Pipe website, along with sample data, software, and example scripts. So let's start with some basics. As we know, general point about time series data, like measured NMR data, we have two aspects of the data. The spectral width, the, what we also used to call the sweep width, which is dependent on the space between points that we sample. And the resolution that we can achieve with the measurement, which is dependent on the distance in time between the first point that we measure and the last point that we measure. And to understand why this is so, we can actually graphically describe how this works. If we have two time domain signals that are very close together in frequency, if we look at them only over a short duration, it's very difficult to tell the difference between them. It's only after the signal has a chance to evolve that we can start to see a marked difference between the two frequencies that are close together. So the longer we sample, the easier it is for us to distinguish between two frequencies that are close together. In other words, the longer the duration between the first and last sample, the higher the resolution that we can achieve. Now, in a one-dimensional experiment, we stimulate our sample with a radio frequency pulse, and then we use an antenna to record the RF information that comes from the sample. And we digitize it as a series of uniformly spaced points. The time it takes to measure this kind of experiment depends completely on the distance and time between the first point and the last point. So in other words, if we sample over one second of time, we have to wait one second whether we sample 10 points or 100 points or 1,000 points. So the measurement time for a 1D experiment only depends on this duration of sampling. That's the one-dimensional case. Now, in two dimensions and higher, the situation is different. In a two-dimensional experiment, as we know, we have more than one RF pulse in the experiment, and we systematically increment the time difference in fixed increments between one pulse and another. And at each increment, we measure a 1D spectrum. The end result is that we have a series of 1D spectra where signals of interest are modulated in some way along this indirect dimension. And in order to take data like that and convert it into a spectrum, we Fourier transform all the rows to generate an interferogram. And then we Fourier transform all the columns to generate a spectrum. 
Now, in the indirect dimension, the maximum resolution that we can achieve is determined by the maximum time distance between these two RF pulses. But the measurement time depends on how many different 1D experiments that we measure. So unlike the situation in the directly detected dimension, in the indirect dimension, the resolution and the measurement time can be manipulated separately. And that is the underlying idea behind non-uniform sampling. In a non-uniform sampled experiment, instead of measuring systematically all of the individual 1D experiments that make up the indirect dimensions of an NMR experiment, we will, according to a particular pattern, which might be random or might be systematic, we will skip some fraction of the one-dimensional measurements. And since there are fewer one-dimensional measurements, the overall experiment time will be less than if we had sampled and recorded every possible 1D experiment in the fully sampled data. So what we have now is the same kind of circumstance that we saw before. The maximum resolution that's achievable still depends on this time duration distance between the first acquired point and the last acquired point. But now the measurement time is less because we've acquired few points in that duration. So we retained the maximum resolution that can be achieved, but we've reduced the measurement time. However, when we have data like this, when we have this non-uniformly sampled data, if we Fourier transform all the rows, we get an interferogram, and the interferogram has gaps in the indirect dimension in the places where we skipped measurements. And so now if we apply a Fourier transform in the indirect dimension to try to generate a spectrum, we get something that doesn't look wonderful. In particular, here's an example. What you see here is a 2D proton carbon measurement on an intact monoclonal antibody. So very big protein, and interestingly, this spectrum was measured at natural isotopic abundance. So this is a conventional measurement, and it's pretty remarkable for a molecule of this size, a natural abundance. Here's a version of that data that we measured with non-uniform sampling. So this data took less than half the amount of time to record, but if we reconstruct it with an ordinary Fourier transform, we get a spectrum that looks like this. It's full of artifacts. And so it's not suitable. Instead, we're going to employ some other kinds of reconstruction techniques that will enable us to regenerate the data, even though certain parts have skipped. And we can generate a spectrum like this with these reconstruction techniques. So if you look between the left and the right, from a visual point of view, these two data sets are equivalent. We could say that we could analyze this one as successfully as this one, but this one took half the time to measure. So that's very good. So for the remainder of the talk, what I'd like to do is talk about the Fourier transform and these other reconstruction techniques and explain how we can get a spectrum like this from non-uniformly sampled data. In a conventional measurement, as we've talked about, we measure a series of uniformly spaced points in the time domain. And then when it's time to do a Fourier transform, we append a set of zeros. We perform zero filling before we Fourier transform the data. Now, in the case of a non-uniformly sampled experiment, as we mentioned, we will randomly skip some fraction of the measured points. And that will give us a data set like this. If we want to generate a spectrum from this kind of data set that has gaps, we have to have some mathematical method that will fill in the gaps. So by one way or another, we're going to find a mathematical method that will fill in the empty spaces. And generally, any method that we find 
that's good enough to fill in the empty spaces inside the data, we can also use to fill in the zero padding that we added. So we can use these reconstruction techniques both to interpolate inside the measured data and to extrapolate after the measured data. What that means is that whatever these special reconstruction techniques are, we will be able to employ them not only to reconstruct non-uniformly sampled data, but also to extrapolate both conventional and non-uniformly sampled data. And we'll see examples of that shortly. But the end result is that we're going to get what looks like normal time domain data, and it will be extrapolated to higher times, so that we'll, overall we'll get a result that has higher resolution too. In order to understand how all of these things work, we can start with an understanding of the Fourier transform, which is the workhorse that we use for converting time domain data to a frequency domain spectrum. And the form that we use it in NMR is the form of the discrete Fourier transform that's shown here. So the data that we want to Fourier transform is this little x of t. And in order to form one point of the Fourier transform, big x of t, we multiply our time domain data by a Fourier term. And the Fourier term has a real part that's a cosine term and an imaginary part that's a minus sine term. And those are shown graphically here. So for every Fourier term in this formula, that Fourier term corresponds to one particular position in the corresponding spectrum. So how does this actually work when we want to generate a Fourier transform? Well, let's say we have some time domain data that we'd like to Fourier transform. What we will do to generate one point in the Fourier transform is to take one of the Fourier terms and multiply it by our time domain data to form a product. Now, all of this happens with complex data, with data that has a real part and an imaginary part. But for clarity, I'm just going to show the real parts of this mechanism. So we have a Fourier term and our time domain data, and we multiply the two of them together, and that forms a product like this. Now, in the subsequent slides, I'm going to monitor the amount of positive data in the product and the amount of negative data in the product with these bar charts on the side. So the amount of positive data in blue, the amount of negative data in pink. When we multiply two different sine waves together, the product that we get has evenly balanced amounts of positive and negative intensity. So that when we add up all the points in this product, we get something that's close to zero. So in the mechanism of generating a complete spectrum, we have a given Fourier term. We multiply that by our time domain data. That forms a product. We add up all the points in the product to form one point in the spectrum. And it's only at circumstances where the frequency of the Fourier term matches one of the frequencies in the time domain data that we get a product that's either predominantly positive or predominantly negative so that when we sum up all the points, we get a peak in the corresponding spectrum. So there are a lot of mathematical ways to explain the Fourier transform, but this graphical way really does it justice. And you can actually see that the Fourier transform is really simple and beautiful, easy to understand. So this is the circumstance with a continuous signal, like the one that I've invented here. In a typical biomolecular case, the indirect dimensions, we can only measure them over a limited duration. And commonly, we're only measuring a relatively small number of points. 
maybe 32, 64, sometimes even less. So what happens to our Fourier transform when we have the more common circumstance of truncated data? We can only measure over a short duration and the signal doesn't decay. Well, when we have truncated data and we bring it through the same Fourier transform mechanism, same as before, we have a Fourier term and we multiply it by the truncated data, that generates a product that's truncated. And so now, when we sum over all the points in this truncated product, we don't have perfect cancellation of the positive and negative parts anymore. And so the nature of the result has two important aspects. One is that you see these truncation artifacts that we call sink wheels in the corresponding spectrum. That's a result of the abrupt difference between the time domain data and the truncated part. And the other thing that you'll see is that even though in this case this is a non-decaying signal that should be perfectly sharp, nevertheless we get a spectrum that has a very broad line. Now, we try to ameliorate these truncation wiggle artifacts and the broadness of the NMR lines that we get by applying digital filters. They're also called window functions or appetization functions. We take our time domain data and multiply it by some function so that when we Fourier transform the data, we can either sharpen the signals at the expense of increasing the truncation artifacts, or we can broaden the signals to reduce the truncation artifacts. And so applying these window functions is very useful. We do it all the time, but it is kind of a compromise between line width and artifacts. The situation, however, becomes more severe the smaller the number of points that we have to deal with. So for example, here are corresponding signals from a time domain data set that consists of 32 points. And here are the corresponding Fourier spectra that are generated from the same signals, but if we only consider the first eight points. And so what you see is when we have only eight points, the lines are radically broader and the artifacts are much bigger and more pronounced too. Even though the underlying signal is exactly the same. So the smaller the number of points, the more severe these artifacts are and the line shapes that we observe in the spectrum have almost nothing to do with the underlying properties of the data themselves they're strictly due to the properties of the Fourier transform and window function that we use. So that's not great. We don't want to have a spectrum that depends on how we reconstructed it. We want to have a spectrum that actually reflects the underlying data. What can we do about it? One of the common remedies is to extrapolate the data so that we have a larger number of points. And the most widely used method for extrapolating NMR data, conventional NMR data, is linear prediction. We won't talk about linear prediction in very great detail, but the simple idea is that we start by building a model that allows us to predict one point in the measured data using a combination of some of the previous points in the measured data. And we use the coefficients that we determine in order to add one synthetic point at the end of the time domain data. And using that synthetic point and the last points in the time domain, we can use the same mechanism to add yet another synthetic point and another and another until eventually we're adding synthetic points based only on previous synthetic points. So this can be a useful way to extrapolate data, and we can continue and add as many synthetic points as we wish. However, the more points that we add, the worse the points 
get because they're based on prior simulated points and so small amounts of noise um, propagate and get larger and larger the larger number of points that we add. So linear prediction is useful but it's not necessarily ideal. In practice though we can get results like this where we have let's say an original spectral data which in the time domain would look like this. We apply linear prediction to extend the time domain data and when we Fourier transform it we get a signal that's sharper than before. So here's an example. This is a section of a triple resonance CB, CA, NH spectrum, nitrogen and carbon here. So here's data with a conventional FT, and here's the corresponding data where linear prediction has been used in both the nitrogen and carbon dimension. And you can see that there are circumstances where we now have beautiful individual resolution of peaks that are overlapped in the Fourier transform result, but they're fairly well resolved in the LP result. So this is useful, but there are aspects of it that aren't ideal. For one thing, it has to be applied on one-dimensional data. It can't be applied in a true three- or four-dimensional way. So what alternatives do we have? Well, we said that one of the alternatives that we have to improving resolution is to employ non-uniform sampling. So let's turn our attention to that now and describe how we can take non-uniformly sampled data and convert it into a spectrum. So we have our non-uniformly sampled data. Particular parts are going to be skipped in the acquisition. So we have these empty spaces that we have to fill in somehow. If we want to use a regular Fourier transform on this data, that corresponds to filling in the missing places with zeros to start with. And so when we take this data and put it through our Fourier transform mechanism, we have our non-uniformly sampled data, which has zeros in different parts. And so when we multiply it by our Fourier term, the product also has zeros in those same positions. And so again, like we saw with the truncated data, when we add up this data, the positive parts and negative parts don't cancel perfectly the way that they used to. And so the result is that we get a spectrum that looks like this. This spectrum that we get looks like it has a pattern of noise in the baseline. And it looks like random noise, but it's not random noise. It's completely deterministic. It's determined by the patterns of points that we kept and the patterns of points that we skipped in the measurement. So why do we do this? Well, we talked about it in different ways before, but if we see these results side by side, it becomes a little clearer. All of these are different sampling schemes. In a conventional sampling scheme where we have long duration and a nice continuous signal, we get a nice flat baseline and a sharp peak. In the conventional circumstance, which is what we live with under most cases, we have a uniformly sampled sampling scheme that's truncated after a certain amount of time. When we have a sampling scheme like this, we get artificially broad looking lines and these regular truncation artifacts. If we have our non-uniformly sampled data, we get a spectrum that has, instead of regular truncation artifacts, these noise-like artifacts in the baseline, but look, the line shape is nice and narrow. So we'd like to find a method that will let us retain this nice sharp line shape without the problem of this apparent noise in the baseline. Now, all of these are different sampling schedules. This is a conventional one. This is a non-uniformly sampled one. They all have different artifacts. So in this case, for a truncated schedule, these artifacts are regular truncation wiggles, and they are the same for all peaks. Big peaks have big truncation wiggles. Small peaks have exactly the same truncation wiggles, but they're proportionally smaller. Same thing for peaks in a non-uniformly sampled spectrum. Big peaks will have this particular pattern of artifact in the baseline. Smaller peaks will have that same pattern, just proportionally smaller. 
So keeping that in mind, that the size of the artifacts is proportional to the size of the signals, that leads directly to one class of methods that we can use to reconstruct the non-uniformly sampled spectrum, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. There are more than a dozen commonly used methods for converting non-uniformly sampled data into spectra. Here are some of them listed. And as a point of fact, the majority of them are actually implemented as part of NMR pipe workflows. So most of the existing methods for reconstructing non-uniformly sampled data can be used in the context of NMR pipe. Today we're going to talk about two methods, IST and SMILE, that are implemented directly inside NMR pipe. And uh, although I won't go through these in detail, there's a list of references that you can refer to if you get a copy of the slides. So let's talk about this technique of reconstruction called IST, or also iterative soft thresholding. So as we mentioned, the size of artifacts in a Fourier transform of the non-uniformly sampled spectrum is proportional to how big the corresponding peak is. So what we can do is choose some threshold which we know is guaranteed to be larger than the largest artifacts in the spectrum. And what we will do is leave everything under the threshold completely unchanged. But above the threshold, we will transfer some of the intensity off the top of the largest peaks into a secondary spectrum, like this. And that will reduce the signal. We'll inverse transform that signal back into the time domain. And whatever points were skipped in the original measurement will be set back to zero. And we'll Fourier transform it back into the frequency domain again. Choose a new threshold that's a bit lower and repeat this procedure over and over again. So we will gradually transfer intensity from the tops of the biggest peaks into our accumulated IST spectrum. And as we transfer intensity, the corresponding artifacts get smaller and smaller because the peaks get smaller and smaller. We can stop these iterations anytime that we want. And whatever residual is left over here, we can add into the final result to be sure that it captures all of the intensity that we measured originally. So it's an easy method to understand and not a difficult method to employ. It doesn't need much in the way of an adjustable parameter. And here's an example of what you can achieve. So here's a 2D proton nitrogen um, spectrum that was measured by conventional measurement techniques and reconstructed by a Fourier transform. And here's a corresponding data set that was measured with non-uniform sampling. So the measurement time was 50% less. But we can reconstruct the spectrum using a combination of IST, interpolation, and extrapolation that's at least as good as the originally measured data from the point of view of visual analysis. So that's really beautiful. Here's what it looks like for three-dimensional triple resonance data. In this display, we have five kinds of triple resonance spectra drawn as strips. And they're drawn in pairs. One strip of the pair is a conventional measurement. And the adjacent strip is the corresponding non-uniformly sampled measurement, in this case, sampled from 33% of the fully sampled data set. So the non-uniformly sampled experiment, in this case, took one-third of the time. And if you look at one strip in the conventional data and one strip from the non-uniformly sampled data, they really correspond pretty beautifully. So here's another nice case where with a third of the measurement time, we can get data that for um, most purposes is completely equivalent. 
Here's an example of the difference between reconstructing non-uniformly sampled data with and without extrapolation. So for example, here's a pair of strips from a reconstruction without extrapolation. And here's that same data reconstructed with extrapolation. So we can reduce the line widths in both indirect dimensions very directly and do it as part of the ordinary reconstruction that we would have to do anyway. So this works very good for non-uniformly sampled data. It also works beautifully on conventional data. So here's an extract from a 3D N15 NOE experiment. The results in blue are from a conventional Fourier transform of the data. The results in green are linear predicted versions of that same data. And the results in pink, which have the sharpest, most well-resolved line shapes, are versions that use IST to extrapolate the data as an alternative to linear prediction. So that works nicely for three-dimensional data. And we can also apply it to four-dimensional data. So here are some planes from a 4D methyl-methyl experiment. Here's what the particular plane looks like if we do a conventional Fourier transform on this 4D data. Here's what it looks like if we use linear prediction on the three indirect dimensions. And here's what the result looks like if we use IST. So we have nice cross peaks, great reduction of the Fourier truncation artifact. Very powerful. The next thing I'd like to do is talk about another more recent reconstruction technique that was introduced by our colleagues at the NIH called SMILE, an algorithm devised by our colleague Jin Fa Ying and Ed Bax's group. Unlike IST, SMILE is a parametric method of reconstructing non uniformly sampled data. As we mentioned before, in a Fourier transform spectrum, we get some line width that's characteristic not only of the underlying decay in the data, but also what sampling schedule that we use. So what SMILE does as a first step is systematically builds a library of ideal time domain signals with different decays and generates corresponding Fourier spectrum. So that SMILE knows for a given line width that's observed in a Fourier spectrum, it can interpret that line width and decide what ideal time domain decay that line width corresponds to. And so in practice, we can start with a regular Fourier transform of the non-uniformly sampled data and at each iteration of the SMILE algorithm, the largest peaks remaining are modeled and used to fill in the empty spaces. And so iteratively, we get a better and better approximation of the final transform. So that's pretty powerful. It also works super fast. So this is one of the fastest reconstruction methods, especially for 4D data. And in the same way that we use IST to extrapolate the data as well as to interpolate the data, we can use SMILE for these purposes. So here's just a comparison. Here are strips from a CB, CA, CO, and H experiment. This is what a particular region of the uniformly sampled data looks like. Here's what the non-uniformly sampled IST reconstruction looks like. So a third of the measurement time, and we can more or less reproduce the original sampled Fourier transform, fully sampled data. If we apply both IST and SMILE plus extrapolation, we can actually get even better resolution than we did in the fully sampled Fourier spectrum. So these peaks that are um, 
completely unresolved in the Fourier spectrum are now beautifully resolved in these reconstructions that include both interpolation and extrapolation. So that's a pretty powerful result. And as we're going to see next week when we go through the software to actually perform these reconstructions, it's incredibly easy. Now, for those of you who have used NMR Pipe before, you will know that we build processing schemes as Unix shell scripts that look like this. And these are Unix pipelines that we'll describe more next week that employ a collection of processing functions to do all the steps in spectral processing. So this is very useful in lots of ways. It's easy to manipulate if you know the details. And this script completely reproduces all of the steps that you use to go from raw time domain data to a spectrum. However, for someone who's not familiar with signal processing or not familiar with Unix and shell scripts, a script like this is terrifying. So one of the things we've done in combination with the facilities that we've added for dealing with non-uniformly sampled data is come up with simpler ways ways to generate processing scripts like this. So the entire script that we saw before can now be replaced with an individual command like this. And if we'd like to do something sophisticated, like add extrapolation by one of these special reconstruction techniques, we can do it very easily with just a few additional arguments. And if we want to apply the same kind of processing to non-uniformly sampled data, instead of conventionally sampled data, we can do it with more or less the same kinds of arguments. So that's one thing that we're going to discuss next week are these new abbreviated commands for generating processing schemes. And we're also going to see a new graphical interface that allows you to do all this processing and script generation without the need to directly edit a script. So that's the overview. I'd like to thank all of the NMR Pipe collaborators who have contributed to NMR Pipe in its 25 years of development. I'm uh, happy to say that the paper describing the software crossed 10,000 citations this year. So thank you all of you for putting the software to good use. Let me add the NIST disclaimer that nothing I describe today is meant to advocate any particular product or service. And let me also thank you. NMR Pipe is brought to you by NIH and NIST, and we hope you'll use it and like it. Thanks very much. Here's our system check, and if there are questions, I'd be delighted to answer them now or later by email. Thanks. If anyone has questions, you can send me a chat, and I can uh, pass those on to Frank. I can also unmute you if you're mic'd, so you can raise your flag. There's a, uh, a menu that has three dots at the bottom of the screen on Max that allow you to raise your flag, and then I can go ahead and unmute you, and uh, you can ask your question. Um, I had one question, so a naive question as a uh, someone who's never collected non-uniformly sampled data. Um, you mentioned that the indirect dimension, the gaps were random. Is that uh, something that people do as a sort of standard practice, or are there uh, strategies or methods that you might sort of leave your gaps out strategically to... Um, yes, that's right. That's an excellent question. So there are three practices in common these days. There are actually lots of different ways to choose those schedules. Um, the earliest proposal was that you would choose the schedules with exponential weighting so that you would sample many more points early in the time domain before the signal is decayed and fewer points later in the time domain. And the idea behind that strategy is that it would enable you to build a sampling schedule that would improve signal to noise because you sample more at the earlier times when the signal is strongest. But as we discussed, the resolution comes from the distance between the first point that you sample and the last point that you sample. So another strategy um, called sine-weighted Poisson gap sampling, 
is to use a scheme where you sample very heavily at the beginning, at the end, both, and less frequently in the center of the time domain data. And that seems to be the sampling schedule that gives the best result um, in many cases. That said, these issues depend on how much your data decays and also what reconstruction method that you use. So certain reconstruction methods will work better um, with exponentially weighted data than uniformly random data. So that's a kind of long-winded answer, but that's how it stands right now. Yeah, and so I guess if you're varying your uh, collection schedule and you're sort of better suited to different methods, is there any benefit to say, you know, maybe combining those approaches in your analysis? So you're, you collect one type, you know, so instead of collecting different you know, pulse sequences or different spectra, you go and you collect different schedules and then process it with different methods so that you can get complementary approaches or that's a, an, an interesting idea, and I, it, I suppose it would depend on what kind of in, information it is that you need to extract from the spectrum, um, and that would influence what kind of sampling schedule that you would use and whether or not you might even consider reprocessing data. Yeah. Um, so in some cases, the important point of the spectrum is simply to see that a peak is there or not there. In other cases, you may want to quantify the chemical shifts of the peak or the intensities of the peak. So depending on what the goal is uh, and depending on the nature of the spectrum and the sample, you might choose your sampling schedules a little bit differently mm -hmm. depending on what mattered to you, um, signal to noise, resolution, measurement time. So non-uniform sampling gives you a way to uh, choose a balance between those different things. That's great. Well, with that, uh, Frank, thank you very much. And uh, we will follow up next week with part two, and we'll see the software in action. So. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.